Good morning, East Bay. What is happening in Alameda, Contra Costa, and Solano counties? We're talking to government, economic, political, nonprofit, and business leaders here in the greater East Bay. Learn about what's happening in our communities, an in depth conversation, so you know what's going on. I'm Jared Ash, the host of the Capstone Conversation. Welcome to today's episode of the Capstone Conversation. I am your host, Jared Ash. Today, we're going to take a look at how workforce relates nationally and locally to our community here in the Bay Area and how workforce agencies can work with employers and with our local city governments and community colleges and all the more with our special guest, Brad Turner Little, who is the president and, and CEO, director, president president and CEO. CEO of oh. the National Association of Workforce Boards. So, Brad, welcome and tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, happy to. Yeah, and Jaren, I'm happy to be with you and, and share about workforce boards and what they do in communities and but we do at the National Association to support them as they work across the country to try to help businesses and talent find their way together more effectively and more efficiently. Um, uh, as I said, I'm the president and CEO of the National Association of Workforce Boards. I will refer to it as NAWB or NOB, just so that you'll know what I'm talking about. So if you hear NOB, that's it's the, 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 the acronym all squished together. But we are the we are the only national membership association that represents and supports the roughly 590 state and local workforce boards. There's about 540 some odd local workforce boards and then 50 plus states because territories have workforce boards as well. So we represent and support those organizations, those those boards and then the around, roughly 12,000 uh, different business members who are active and involved in local workforce boards. We advocate on their behalf with Congress and the administration to try to create greater uh, flexibility and the agility for local workforce boards to be responsive to what local business needs they uncover and understand and help build better, better bridges for talent to access opportunity. And we do that for providing a variety of tools and resources and supports like any other sort of association would for its organization members. So that's a little bit of kind of... A, of who we are and the organization that I get to lead. Tell us, Brad, before we dive into more about the organization and the great work you guys do, tell us who is Brad? Oh, well, so I am a, a long product. Actually, I've built my career in the space of workforce development. Back in the mid 90s, my uh, workforce career started with Goodwill Industries of Northwest North Carolina in Winston-Salem. And I was a job developer then. That my, my job was to be out in the business community and cultivating relationships with employers so that as folks came through Goodwill programs, they would have job opportunities available to them when they, when they graduated. I've done work. I apologize, Jared. So my dog has decided he wants to participate in the interview. So Beckett, it's okay. It's all right. There you go. Good boy. So Fridays are a work from home day for me, which he really enjoys. And apparently there's something happening outside, which he desperately wants to be a part of, but he will wait. But I, I've worked at the local level, helping people, working with businesses to understand their talent needs. How are they thinking about sort of competitive forces and how they were thinking about like their, the, both the competency sets and the skills they would need at, sort of at that time and then years in the future and how sort of goodwill as a part of the workforce ecosystem could help them in that process. Then I've. I, I've done work at the national level, both for Goodwill Industries International and Easter Seals, which is another national nonprofit or not another national nonprofit organization focused on the needs of individuals and families with disability. When disability is present, and my work there was again around helping people with disabilities, helping Easter Seals support people with disabilities finding employment. And so I've done I, I've done a variety of types of things over the course of my career, but it really has been a, the through line, Jared, has been a fundamental belief for me. And the power, both the power and the dignity that work represents for people. It is the thing that can transform us. It is the vehicle that gives us resource to provide for our families in the way that we want. It gives us a, uh, a sense of contribution to our, 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 not just our families, but our communities. And it is, work is the 
I, I believe the force to that not just gives dignity, but also can really help transform lives. And so the through line of my career is, is how can I use uh, the resources that I've been given, the tables that I'm at, uh, to create greater opportunities for more of all of our neighbors to, to participate in work, build a career, particularly one that, you know, and that's meaningful and feels like that folks can, are really contributing to their community. So that's a little bit about me. I live in Maryland, just north of uh, our nation's capital. Our offices are actually in Washington, D.C. I have a dog, two cats. I got two kids, one in law school, one in college, and uh, 30 years of marriage. What else do you need to know? Well, you know, for the YouTube visitor, they can see it. And for everybody else who's just listening in their car, you have more than 25 baseballs oh. in a base frame behind you. What are those? Because I'm, I'm curious so, to get some good insight into you. Well, and so interestingly enough, so it's not as present in this particular camera view, but lots of other parts of here in my study are, it's, it's terribly evident that I'm a Wake Forest demon deacon. And today is college baseball opening day. And, and the, the, the Deeks open at home against Fordham at five o'clock Eastern. I'm sure it's available somewhere, some way, shape or form. Although uh, folks, I'm sure from like Cal State Fullerton or whatever else, they think they know baseball. But uh, we've got quite the powerhouse back in my old stomping grounds. But these are all baseballs from minor league stadiums across the country back when I was doing a lot of consultation work, particularly from sort of the May through sort of August time frame where I would be out. I would go to minor league baseball games. So many of them are from minor league stadiums. That's great. And as most of my listeners have figured out, I am a Florida State fan. So we love oh. pushing the Demon Deacons in most ways possible. Although we did, we did beat Bobby Bowden in his last home game. Like the only time you ever, <laughs> right? Like hey, that's it was a good one to win. The, that's 34 losses that you had in previous <laughs> season. It was a good so, one. Uh, it was a good one to win. Well, and the Demon Deacons are now, are, are part of the ACC, which the Atlantic Coast Conference now includes the University oh. of California, Berkeley and Stanford. So two oh. Bay Area schools. So we will, exactly. maybe you'll come out here for a game. Well, yeah. that's, there's some people at, at Berkeley or something. It'll be good. Excellent. That'd be great. Yeah, that'd be lovely. Okay, let's dive back into workforce sports. Okay. So talk a little bit about how do the local agencies work? And then I'll come back to the national picture. But yep. I want to frame it back locally. And there's dozens and dozens in California. And almost every county in the Bay Area has their own. And we're going to interview them at a later state. But okay. now talk about what does the local agency focus on a little bit more? Um, and then we'll circle back to national stuff. Sure. Absolutely. So interestingly enough, so in California, there actually are 45 local workforce boards. There is also a state workforce board, but in, in so, you know, in Sacramento and LA and, and Bakersfield, I actually have a baseball for Bakersfield. There are, so th there are local workforce boards and these are entities in every community authorized through a piece of federal legislation called the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And their responsibility is to, as I articulated kind of at the onset, is to deeply understand what's happening in a local labor market and then bring together sort of the, the, the various players in that ecosystem, if you would, right? Education, business, chamber, economic development, the community colleges, community-based organizations, the folks that all support the supporting talent, finding opportunity in that local economy, they bring together strategic programs to equip talent based on what the local businesses say that they need. And then they facilitate partnerships. They can offer various types of specialized training. And they are all, um, they are cr these boards, the local workforce board is created by, I referenced the, the federal legislation, it's known as WIOA. In WIOA, it outlines that the chief local elected official appoints the local workforce board. But 51% of the members of the local workforce board have to be from the business community. And then the other, uh, the other folks on the board are, there's some state agencies, state government agencies, like a, you know, a corresponding department of labor or health and human services, education, those kinds of things. There is a, there are also representations from labor, 
from community-based organizations, from the state organization providing services to people with disabilities called vocational rehabilitation, and a couple other folks are sort of on there. But the, the chief elect, local elected official appoints all of those folks. And then they, they in turn administer federal programs for, we call them Title I programs, but they're for adults. So the funds flow into every community across the country to help adults find work are administered by this group of people and they oversee, and it's, it's labeled differently, Jared, in different states, but the American Job Center Network, which is a one-stop system where, you know, if you're looking for work, there is a physical location. And oftentimes there is also a virtual location where you can log into or go into and receive services to help you find work. And they're scattered all across the country. And they, so these boards administer those and run those program or run those operations. But at their, at, you know, I think probably most importantly, you know, for your audience, it's important to know that no matter what community that they're in, you know, in the state of California or in other markets, there are a group of people who are focused, the laser focused on creating a local system that enables individuals in that community to become self-sufficient through work. There's a group of people, same people, same conversation, focused on how they can ensure that employers are having skilled workers in order to compete in today's economy. And a group of people who are 100% dedicated to helping people who are unemployed or they feel underemployed to find different jobs or new career paths. So let's talk about that coalition that you talk about, right? And we'll look at it from a, a national perspective and break it down a little bit locally. How do labor, chambers, industry, community-based organizations, government, well, those groups don't get along, right? Or they're just, <laughs> they all have their own opinion. How do you, how do they work through that? And then how do they tailor it locally, right? Yeah. So it's a great question. And it's the, you know, so this, the, the, this current system that we have, like it, it dates back to the Manpower Development Act from the sixties. I mean, there was a lot of turbulence in our economy and the federal government felt like it needed to have an intentional role in helping business and talent come together. It's actually at the department, federal department of labor, it was what formed the employment and training administration which is focused on this issue. Over time, different pieces of legislation sort of all born out of that Manpower Development Act resulted in a really, I, quite candidly, a, a very fragmented system. A bit to your point, Jared, there were each, like each group kind of had their own thing. I mean, they really didn't talk all that much and they didn't really share resource or share strategy or think collectively together. And so in 1998, the precursor to current law was passed called the Workforce Investment Act. And in that act, it established kind of the core structures of what we have today that said that, all right, at the state level and the local level, all of these entities need to come together at a table and establish a local or state uh, plan. And so I think one of the key, the keys in response to your question, Jared, is is the planning process that these local boards go through. So, because at the end of the day, all of those entities which, which you and I have talked about, government, biz, you know, chamber, unions, talent development, you know, the, ed the education system, community-based organizations, they all want people to be working. They all want, right? I mean, that, that, like, that is the thing that unifies folks kind of in this conversation is that, and even more so now, right? We've got more openings in our economy, job openings in our economy than we have people. And so like it, it is, businesses are really feeling the need to, to get talent. And so if all of these entities have some part of that puzzle, right? The local workforce board is the place where all those puzzle pieces come together and they work on a plan, right? that's based on deep labor market analysis, different sources of data from the Fed, from the states, private sector data is used to really understand what's happening 
in different, you know, what's happening in our sort of area for economic development, where sort of what are the skill needs necessary for that? And then how do we align the resources that we have in our community um, to best prepare people for those opportunities? And so, uh, you know, at its, at its best, the workforce system is not about any one particular program. It's really about how do we leverage these assets in our community to better prepare workers for the opportunities that exist today and that will come tomorrow. And I think that when it works at its best, people really sort of put their label behind them and put the interest of the, of, you know, uh, of folk looking for work and quite candidly of businesses looking to hire. You put that at the forefront and say, how do we help that happen? How do we help those groups come together more effectively and more efficiently? Then it works really, really well. That's, that's helpful, right? It's the common goal, right? That we want to put people to work and have the right worker. How do workforce boards then keep up with the changing times? The advancement of AI coming into the workforce, communications. I was in a mastermind group this morning and some of the people were complaining like they have clients hitting them up on nine different forms of communication, right? Like how do you prepare workers for any of that stuff or, right? It used to be, okay, you got to learn Excel. Well, that was easy. Now we're like a million different Excels or CRMs. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's such a, it's such a huge issue, right? And in different, and people experience that differently too, right? So, you know, I think about, think about those folks, you know, you know, 97% of the individuals who are currently incarcerated are going to be released, right? And if you've been, that, you know, that's, when you look at DOJ data, right, you, that's, you know, that, that's a, that's a reality. And if you've been in, if you've been incarcerated for 20 years, right, the, the way the world works is it's not just fundamentally different. Like it is transformationally different, right? The iPhone, I don't think the iPhone was out 20 years ago. Like I had a pager when I started and I, and, a, and, and the, like, I got all excited in, in 1998 when I got, when I got a Blackberry and just. Just think about how different sort of the way the world operates. And, and from a worker perspective, the digital skill, which is necessary, like you're talking about Excel and, you know, and, I mean, you can think about like coding and web design and all those kinds of things, but even simple things about interfacing, like using an app on a phone, right? What's an app, right? And so you've got this big swath of people you know, and then you've got other folks that 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 have struggled with digital literacy, that there's a real impediment to being able to engage and participate in work. And so it is a big, big issue for us, Jared, I think as a country, is how are we going to, you know, how do we invest to build people's digital skills? It's all it is arguably as fundamental as the old like when I was coming up, right? When I was in school, we had the three R's, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Now, like, I mean, there's another component of that, which is foundational to be able to participate in the economy, which is digital skill. And I know there've been investments that Google and others have made in this space to try to bolster and build people's digital skills. And I'm really, really pleased, actually, in Congress, there's a bill that's been passed out of committee to reauthorize the Workforce um, um, Innovation and Opportunity Act called the Stronger Workforce for America Act. Anyway, in that, there is a provision that clearly outlines that part of the use of funds for adults or dislocated workers can be used to build digital skills. When, you know, the current law was, was passed in 2014, like that really wasn't an issue. I mean, it was, but it wasn't in the public discourse the way that it is now. So I think more and more sort of systems are waking up to the reality of this is a big, like, this is a big issue not just for individual workers, but arguably for our competitiveness as a country. We've got to have people who have these kinds of skills for businesses to compete in a global economy. And because whether you're, you know, you're selling stuff out of your garage or whether you're working for IBM, like you're competing in a global economy. I mean, 
I mean, we buy, you know, I mean, you probably buy stuff from Etsy for folks who are, you know, in, in Brazil, right? So like it, it is a global economy. And so how do people survive in that? Right. And, and the workforce system, you know, has a stake in that and local workforce boards, I think, you know, part of your question goes to like being really deeply connected to what's so to and understanding what local businesses are really experiencing, not just from a, a like a talent gap, like trying to hire people, but like, what are the actual competencies that they need to be able to be competitive in that kind of environment? Like, what are the skills they need? And then, and then the board gets to think about, all right, then what do we have access to in our community, either in like on the ground, bricks and mortar or virtually that can help people build those competency sets to, if, you know, to leverage those opportunities for work that are in our local economy. So it really, it, it all it, quite candidly, Jared, you know, the core of the, of the work is based on data. It's about the, so the, the quantitative data. So all the stuff that gets released from the department of labor or at state level, federal level, whatever, but also the qualitative data, right? Those conversations with members of the chamber, with small business, with, you know, different sort of associations that may exist in a community and deeply understanding through dialogue, like, what are you dealing with? What are you thinking about? What are the skills and competencies that you need today? Not just today, but what you're going to need tomorrow. Those are really, really fundamental pieces of data that inform then the building of the plan and the orchestrating of resources in a community to help bridge that gap. And so I'm going to challenge all the listeners. If you know, without Googling it, when was the iPhone invented? I will get email me and I will give you a shout out on a future podcast, but I will tell people the answer before we leave this episode as well. So actually, no, I'm not going to tell you the, the answer. Look it up. Know it. If you know it without Googling it, hit me up and you'll get that shout out. So that will go that way. And we'll also well, even, like, but you make my point, Jared, right? Yeah. Like Googling it is now like, that's a verb, right? Right. That's the, that, that's part of the, part of the, Part of the point, which is, I mean, it's really funny. You will link to that federal bill that, that Brad referenced as well in the show notes. Brad, you also talk about the employer hiring needs, that there's not enough workforce now because we're at a record low employment. And I remember in economics class in my master's degree, they were talking about how four to 5% unemployment was like standard because then you always had people to hire. That was a good number. Well, we've been at three or less or some fraction of it for a long time in this country. We've heard that a lot of the cities here, right, have openings. And it's gotten better over the last year of, of as we've entered 2024 than it was at 2022. But how does that change what the Workforce Board is doing? I was talking to a, a temp agency CEO and a, and a chamber luncheon the, yesterday. And he said, no, we get a ton of work because people want them to come back into their office and they can't find workers. And so they're happy to hire temp workers and temp working works in some people's schedules better. Yeah. Please share some thoughts around all of that. No, it's, uh, I mean, it's, you know, the, the, you know, pre 2020, you know, the, the, there were all kinds of, I mean, both from a global perspective and then I think here domestically, when we think about the work that like OEC, OEC, OECD did, it has done. When you look at the work like sort of like Accenture at that time from, you know, pre-2020, like everybody was talking about sort of the, the future of technology and the future of work and how it was going to create efficiencies and all these kinds of things. And all COVID did was just like accelerate us 10 to 15 years. We all had to figure out how to do this, how to work from home. And so all those, like, it just, it just, it, we went through all a whole 10 year cycle within a year and a half period in terms of technological advancements and the way that the work happens. So, you know, you combine that with people's priorities began to change a bit at, you know, through, through those times, you know, I've got a, I, you know, at my former employer, I had a colleague that she had a PO box and she moved every quarter to a different city and did an Airbnb. Like that. Like that's just, that's a fundamentally different way of working. And what I offer that Jared is that now, and you look at the rise in gig economy 
the number of people who are involved in freelance activity, not just this kind of, you know, sort of side hustle work, but actually to be that's the way that they want to work. And you made the point, right? Tim Corpers connected to kind of the freelancing kind of space, right? I believe that we are in a, we, that, that, that COVID accelerated the disruption that has been happening with the social contract between employers and employees. And when you look at the core components and you reference sort of the, 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 the Keynesian sort of full employment being, you know, three to 4%, and you're always going to have this little gap of people right at the bottom, the, 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 similarly, the, the social contract that exists from that, the, the, the Keynesian sort of perspective, you know, it was codified in the Fair Labor Standards Act passed in 1938, when our economy was based on, you make a widget and I pay you per widget that you make. Like that was the core of the economy. And so it was a very straightforward social contract. You make this, I pay you that. Now that is completely uh, turned on its head, right? And you've even got, and I know that, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a different level of resource, but you've got companies like Amazon that are actually intentionally talking to other employers in communities and saying, hey, what are the skill sets that your workers are going to need? And we'll help our people through their own career choice program, right? We'll help people build those skills on our dime. So when they leave us, they can come to work for you. Like that is a fundamental different approach to the social contract about what, what do I expect as an employee and what will I give you as an employer, right? It's just, it's very, very different. And so I think, you know, the, the so I, number one, I think there's been this massive disruption and the, the, there is transformation happening in the social contract between employers and employees, number one. Number two, I think that, you know, we are learning how, you know, different ways of working that are creating different types of opportunities for people. And a workforce board is in the space of how do we understand those newly emerging opportunities and help people build skills to be ready to leverage and take advantage of those new kinds of opportunities, particularly folks that may have had disadvantages in getting access to those opportunities in the first place, right? And opening the door. Uh, and then lastly, I would say, Jared, that, you know, when the Bureau of Labor Statistics at the federal level, you know, the first Friday of the month, they release unemployment data and whatever. So hopefully in your econ class, they talked about the fact that that is what is known as U3 data. And so it's a very limited set of our population, right? Those are people who within the last six months had been working and are currently and are currently actively looking for work. You don't fit that definition. You're not included in the, in the unemployment rate. And there's a lot of people that have dropped out and they're not included in the unemployment rate. They dropped out during COVID. They dropped out part of the great recession and never recovered. You had the great resignation that happened, right? Where all these people, you know, were leaving work and trying to find their own way, right? And so, you know, you're not counted in those numbers. You dropped out, right? And so it doesn't account for the number of people that are transitioning out of a period of incarceration. It doesn't count for the number of individuals with disabilities that will be looking for work and want to work, but because of asset limitations for health insurance and social security can't work. It doesn't count the number of people that are arguably sort of underemployed, right? So when you look at, so, so when you look at other data sets from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, like U6 data, you see that oftentimes the U6 data, which has a much bigger swath of the population, those unemployment rates tend to be about two to three X bigger than the U3 rate. So I think that's an important, hopefully, I apologize if that's a little technical for sort of the group, but like that's an important piece of conversation that you know, when those numbers come out at the beginning of the month on that Friday, you know, I, you know, it's, you're not questioning, you know, I'm, like that's valid, but you actually really need to understand the definition and say, huh, who's not in that definition? So what are we, what's the part of the story we're missing? Because there are hidden workers out there that aren't included in that group. But additionally, I would say, Jared, you know, there's, there are groups 
con that continue in our country to not be able to have the access that other groups do. And so when you look at unemployment rates, the U3 data within different groupings like American Indians, when you look at African Americans, when you look at people with disabilities, when you look at other groups, right, you'll see that, it's, there, that there are gaps there and it, it's a big issue. That said, the numbers bear out, right? When, as boomers are retiring and choosing to opt out of work, there are big gaps between what employers, the number of people they need and the number of people available. That's true. But that's, I think, forcing ways, companies to rethink the way work happens, which then I think can create new kinds of opportunities for people. If the system is willing to lean in and help people build those confidence. Not such an easy task ahead of, of all those agencies. And I, I was somebody who resigned during the great resignation. And part of that was what you're talking about, right? That social contract with work change. And I said, okay. If I'm in this job and I'd been there for 10 years at the same consulting firm, where am I going to be in another 10 years? And are they helping me get prepared for it? And when I looked at it, I was going to be making, you know, maybe a 1.3% annual average pay bump. No. So not anything substantial, less than inflation has been by far. And I said, okay, what skills do I want to learn or how am I going to grow and how do I increase my income substantially? And that led me to creating my own firm and my own business model. But I could see where that social contract had changed between me and my employer. They weren't doing anything, putting the money aside to, to say, we want to empower Jared to be the best person that he can be. And I took that. And another example is I really? remember when my oldest daughter was in kindergarten, I was, I've was i worked from home for a long time. I was the only dad on the playground for a Halloween costume party. And mm. then COVID hit. And now you go and two thirds of the or, or dads are just a mixed thing because everybody can be flexible and work from home that day. And there's two areas where I noticed that social sort of change with the employer has, has happened and, and addressing that from a workforce board. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it, it's, it's a, it's a, I think it's an important, it's both a fascinating and an important discussion for, for, for businesses to have. I mean, I think about it because I'm, I mean, I'm a small business. I have eight, nine people that work for me and I have to think about those things, right? What, what, what is the, what is part of my social contract? beyond the, sort of the salary or wages that I'm offering, you know, there, there are other things that, that my employees expect or want out of this experience. And how do I afford that for not, not financially, but how do I create? Cause that's part of the retention strategy. Like I need to do that so I can keep, you know, I can keep expertise. I can keep knowledge. I can grow knowledge and expertise and it helps my flywheel go faster. So I, you know, it, it's an important, uh, it's an important discussion and it's really, you know, but in a front, what's interesting is that the, like the policy framework for that discussion, they back to 1938 and I, I don't, I don't have a lot of levers that I can pull. And interestingly enough, like, even when you think about like in the eighties, when the, the, that, I think it was 1986 tuition reimbursement. You, you, you receive, you know, tuition reimbursement from an employer and there was a, and it wouldn't, in fact, it could be pre-tax. You, you wouldn't be taxed on the amount that the employer had, had uh, allocated for that. It was 5200 and I think $85 or something. I think that's, may not be, somebody can Google that. But it's in the 5200 range. That number has not gone up since 1986 when it was established. That the amount of, of, that a company can have available free tax for an employee. Like what, like, why not? Like <laughs> rising costs of education, the, the knowledge base, you know, the, the knowledge that employers have that I need to invest in my people to help build their skills and build their competencies. Right. That's the whole upskilling conversation. Like of the talent that I've got, how do I grow them? Well, in the tax code, like I'm operating under 1986 requirement. Well, Congressman DeSalle, Congressman Swalwell, I know some of your staff listens to this. Like 
like love you guys to weigh in on that issue and set up a conversation with Brad to to just talk about that. I, I also just argue with things like gas mileage reimbursement, right? Gas it in California versus New Jersey is which has all the refineries there is substantially more, right? Why do we get the same reimbursement for miles from a central IRS agency? Mm. So I get what you're you're talking about. And hopefully that example relates to everybody driving who's complaining about their mileage reimbursement. Uh, I I want to hit on equity within that. Right. That's a huge word here in California is mm -hmm. equity, inclusion, and diversity, D DEI. I did it backward. But talk about how workforce boards are tackling that, maybe some best practices. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's a, a, another a important part of the conversation, Jared. So I appreciate you raising it up. I, I think there's a couple of things that sort of workforce boards are, are really doing in this space. Number one, Interestingly enough, we've been working with uh, a group called CAEL, C-A-E-L, the Center for Adult Education Leadership, and have established both a master class and now leadership cohorts in incorporating equity into your local workforce board operations to really help. So we've got some real leaders in this space, but to help the rest of the workforce boards sort of have models about what it means to really incorporate equity into the way that you operate. So, so we, you know, we know this is an important issue. Secondly, I would say that, you know, workforce boards now are in a place where, you know, they're, they're looking hard at, so all, all these boards have to report data on the, not, not just the services that they provided, but the, the characteristics of the individual receiving said services. Right. And so there's a inside what are known as workforce information systems that there is there are concerted efforts to number one get better quality of data and number two do better analytics on the data to look at where is the system over indexing or under indexing in terms of providing access and opportunity for all of our neighbors and quite candidly jerry that's been a frame that i have really been leaning into about this is about all of our neighbors right because it, it's 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 about you know, how does this system, which is a federal system that's supposed to support all of, all of us, how does it actually support all of our neighbors? And in, in order to authentically do that, we need to understand how we're, how we are supporting and engaging and providing uh, both access and opportunity it's in our neighborhood. Um, and I, and I think that's an important frame. I know there's, you know, there's been certainly after, you know, the, the issues around race and, and gender equity, LGBTQ plus issues, right, those are significant pieces. My concern is that in the discourse that we lose sight of the individual, the people, and from a, a workforce system perspective, that our responsibility is to help, again, all of our neighbors find ac access to opportunity into career growth, right? That, that's what we exist to do. And so I know, you know, there are some, some corporate entities which are backing away from DEIA kind of work and the language and whatever else. But to me, in a lot of ways, I remember, so I, I was working for, actually, so it was my early days with Goodwill, with the transition from the Clinton administration to the Bush administration, right? And overnight, magically, somehow the digital divide went away. And like, it didn't. But people got caught up in the language, but the circumstance was there, right? And, you know, earlier this year, um, I have family in West Tennessee. I have a cousin who posted a picture of a work crew in this little town called Lexington, Tennessee. It's near Bucksnort and Bellbuckle, all right? So that's, that's the size of the town we're talking about. She posted a picture of some workers at a utility pole running cable. And broadband was finally getting to Lexington, Tennessee, right? This was, and we were talking about digital divide in the nineties. And well, you know, earlier in, well, I guess it was 2023, it wasn't earlier this year. So in late 20, 2023, in the fall of 2023, broadband finally got to Lexington, Tennessee. So. I mean, when, when you get caught up in the, the language and the, 
I, I, I think it, it distracts from the actual issue, right? And those people in Lexington need access to economic opportunity. And businesses need access to those people who live in Lexington because there's talent and skill there, right? And broadband is critical to make that happen. And, and so anyway, I, I, just, I offer that as kind of a, an example of why I think it's really important, certainly from an NAWB perspective, absolutely issues around equity and understanding how is our system doing in serving different segments of our population and creating access? Are we over-indexing certain places? Are we under-indexing certain places? How do we make sure? But at the end of the day, it's about how are we making sure that all of our neighbors are being able to participate, hopefully, in what we like to call economic vitality in communities. So. That, appreciate those those thoughts and, and the story because I think it just paints a picture of where things are missing on people's mind. Talk about employers working with these agencies and looking for employees. How do companies that have need engage with workforce boards? How can they better engage their employees in ongoing training once they're there? Yep. Just get that perspective. How can we, what, Absolutely. what role does the employers have in workforce development? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think it, I mean, they're, they're, they're at the end of the day, I mean, they're sort of the linchpin customer, right? I mean, that it's, it's to be able to help them get talent. So I have a couple of sort of thoughts on that front. Number one, you know, engaging with a local workforce board, you know, and, and, and there's a, for California, there's an easy way to find all your workforce boards through the California Workforce Association. It's a, a, you, you can Google that and, and find it very quickly. You can also go to careeronestop.org, which is the federal site, which will help you find those things to find the contact. But it's, a, you know, it's as simple as a phone call to the local board and say, hey, I want to get involved and I'm interested. I, I have talent needs, number one, or I, and or. I, I'd like to get involved in certain ways. And I think there's a couple of suggestions on that front. Workforce boards will oftentimes, they'll organize industry-led capacity building groups. So within the healthcare sector, right? So you run a, you know, a, 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 an in-home nursing support company, right? You with certified nursing assistants and, and some RNs and those kinds of things, right? So they, they bring everybody together in the healthcare industry and say, okay, how do we think about talent, growing talent in the healthcare industry in our region? And have the whole sector talk about that together and think about leveraging assets in a fundamentally different type of way to build the talent that's needed. So that's one. Number two, local boards are a great place for small businesses to get involved in creating working and learning experiences for people in the community, right? Through on the job training through internships, arguably even through apprenticeship program, accessing those. There are apprenticeships popping up in all kinds of sectors and workforce boards can help make that happen. But I think that's another critical and important way that small businesses, particularly through on-the-job training, where the workforce board is actually able to pay part of wages and even in transitional jobs, what we call transitional jobs, where people are building certain competency sets, the workforce board is able to offset wages for that time where the individual is working for you. Third, we do have workforce boards that create that that work together with with industry to do talent development projects. Uh, so very specifically targeted. So they'll work they'll work together with a community college or with an institution of higher education and with certain industry sectors and say, okay, we're going to go hard on welders, right? We're going to we're we're going to have a concerted effort to increase the number of welders in our community. How do we leverage all these kinds of things together? But let industry really drive that, and the workforce board is able to to catalyze and coordinate resource to help support that happen. And then, you know, fundamentally, you know, a workforce board is a place where you can, you know, a small business can improve its outreach and recruitment strategies as it's looking for talent. They do job fairs all over the place and bring in employers. Matter of fact, I'm going to be in El Paso next week and they're having a reverse job fair where, where employers, their job seeker is going to be in the middle and employers are going to go around them and, and, and interview them, right? But anyway, there, there's lots of different strategies. We have a board, a workforce board in, in Las Vegas that actually a business, he's a small business owner, owns a gym, a workout facility, and he has a, a youth center in, that the workforce board operates inside his gym. 
And so kids that both who are in school and those who might not be, who have not found their way successfully in school or out of school, you, they come, they come to this gym and receive services to help them get back either into school or into education or into work because he believes in the value of, of what a workforce system, what workforce board can do in a community. And he's able to source his own talent from that group as well. But anyway, there's, there's, you know, it, and, you know, at the base of it all, right, is if you're a small business owner or you're a hiring manager and you're struggling to find people, you can reach out to your local workforce board and they can help you with recruitment. Appreciate that. Before we finish up here, my last question for everybody is, is what else haven't I asked? Are there any big initiatives you're working on? Anything, any other messages you want to share before we head out? Yeah, so just one one thing just to put up, you know, for, for, for your audience that I think is a, an interesting, it, and it connects back to your, sort of, we were talking about sort of the evolution of the social contract conversation, right? So one of the things that you, we really have begun to deeply understand is that, so I mentioned I went to Wake Forest, right? I have a degree in sociology and economics, and I happen to remember some of the Keynesian stuff, but in general, like, I, I really don't use my college degree all that much. And so it, it begs a question in the hiring process about what it, like, really what do degrees and credentials communicate? And are there better ways for talent to be able to show these are my competencies to you as a, as a, as a business that can help create value for you? And as a business operator, right, how do I do all the jobs that I have actually require a college degree or is it a better exercise for me to really deeply understand the competencies and skills that are needed in a particular job and so there's a lot of there's a lot of percolation right now in a, in the conversation around skills based or skill spur hiring and advancement where it it's it's sort of transforming the way again that talent and business are able to communicate with one another to reach agreement, to come together and do something. And how do you, and what's required, what would be required to really rethink the way that in essence, supply and demand come together in the hiring process? And what are those speeder systems? And how can we, you know, and how can our economies be, be transformed if it's a skills-based type conversation versus a degree-based conversation? Because there's also a good bit of data out there that, that I think does point to that, to, you know, skewing to certain segments in our population that have been able to access degrees, but others can't. And so people are blocked out of opportunity. And so you see states, I think there are 14 states now, 13 states that have dropped college degree requirements for a number of positions within state hiring processes. When you look at, you know, you've got big companies that are, that are exploring that similar type of transformation and, and, and changing the way that they assess and understand talent and, and what they're looking for as a mechanism to understand what talent can bring to them. And, and I think that's really, I think it's really, really interesting and quite candidly, Jared, I think it's, it's actually a more equitable way of, of having a conversation and, and understanding talent and business needs. And what talent can bring and what business needs, I think it's a, it, 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 it opens the door to many, many more people. But we've got a lot of work to do in that space. I think both as workforce boards and then I think more broadly as an economy to really understand what it's going to take to transform the way hiring and advancement happens. Because it's happens, you know, this way for so long. But there's some real institutional and sort of systemic inertia in the space. But I think it's a really important conversation and one I hope that your listeners uh, will Google and learn about and explore and how they might get involved in that conversation. Great. I appreciate that. We will link to the National Association as well as the, all the local workforce boards. There are, I think, seven in the nine counties under the under sort of ABAG or MTC jurisdiction with everybody but Marin and Napa, I think, having their own independent ones. So, so we'll put those links and we'll interview a couple of them later this year. So Brad Turner, Little National Association of Workforce Boards. I really appreciate your time today. Sure thing. My pleasure. Wait. 
don't leave yet. Hit subscribe. Make sure you get the weekly updates. We have a new episode every Wednesday for stuff happening in the East Bay. In the meantime, follow me on LinkedIn, Jared Ash, or check out our firm where we have a weekly newsletter and blog at Capstone Government Affairs on LinkedIn. Thanks for joining us today on the Capstone Conversation.